Welcome to Brookings. I'm Stephanie Aronson, Vice President and Director of the Economic Studies Program here at Brookings. Thank you for joining us for Improving Opportunity Through Access to Family Planning. Before we begin, I want to take the opportunity to thank Isabel Sawhill and our Future of the Middle Class Initiative for organizing today's event. I also want to thank Governor Jack Markell and all of our panelists for their participation, and Morgan Welch and Anna Dawson for helping to coordinate the event. Nearly half the 6.1 million yearly pregnancies in the United States are unplanned, as are about one-third of all births. These unplanned pregnancies, whether unwanted or mistimed, are associated with a wide variety of negative health, economic, educational, and psychological outcomes for both children and parents. While the subject remains controversial in some quarters, most people agree that empowering women to have only the children they want has positive benefits for everyone in the form of better pregnancy outcomes, improved child well-being, more opportunities for women and their partners, reductions in cost to governments, and lower abortion rates. To achieve these improved outcomes, however, we need to base our policies on the latest research and learn from past efforts. This event brings together a mix of researchers and policymakers to provide us with just such an update. The conference focuses on the release of a new report by Brookings Senior Fellow Isabel Sawhill and Senior Research Assistant Catherine Guio, Preventing Unplanned Pregnancies, Lessons from the States, which looks at strategies for reducing unplanned pregnancies and births, especially at the state level. After Bell provides us with a summary of the report, we will hear from three panels with an all-star cast of experts from around the country, which will focus in turn on state experiences with pregnancy prevention, new approaches to reducing unplanned pregnancies, and what the research says about the success of various strategies. But before that, to get us started here today, it is my great pleasure to welcome our keynote speaker, Governor Jack Markell, who led the path-breaking efforts in Delaware to reduce the rate of unplanned pregnancies. Markell served, served two terms as Delaware's governor, completing his tenure in 2017. Under his leadership, Delaware won the top spot in President Obama's Race to the Top competition, and high school graduation rates saw some of their best increases in the country. Markell also served as chair of the National Governors Association. His work on unplanned pregnancy began back in 2014. At the time, Delaware had the highest percentage of unplanned pregnancy of any state in the U.S., 57%. As you will hear, it subsequently made substantial progress in reducing that rate. I hope today's event helps to further improve opportunities for women, men, and children by shedding light on the most effective strategies to reduce unplanned pregnancies and births, in part by showing what Delaware and other states have accomplished by ensuring more women have access to the most effective forms of contraception. On that note, and on behalf of Brookings, I'm delighted to welcome the 73rd Governor of Delaware, Jack Markell. Thank well, thank you, Stephanie. Wonderful uh, to be here. And I want to start by thanking uh, Isabel Sawhill for the uh, invitation. I think the report uh, that you and your uh, colleague have uh, produced is really uh, excellent, and I encourage everybody to, uh, to, to read it. I do appreciate uh, Stephanie characterizing the panels to come as being an all-star cast of experts, and I would just point out that many of them are either from Delaware or with Upstream USA. And uh, since I served as Delaware's governor and I'm on the board of uh, National Board of Upstream USA, I totally agree with the char characterization. Um, you know, most of us who run for office, uh, I think, do so because we believe that it's all about expanding economic opportunity. I mean, that was, the, you know, if you had to ask me the single most important reason I ran, it was about 
helping more people achieve their, their potential and seize all the opportunities available uh, to them. And that, that is absolutely why I ran for governor of Delaware. And in my, through, through much of my uh, time in office, I served uh, eight years, two terms, which is the most you can serve uh, in Delaware. I focused on many of the typical traditional policy areas, everything from early childhood education, and we made significant strides, uh, better career and technical education, making it possible for more low-income students, uh, but high-performing low-income students to attend college, focusing on reducing mass incarceration and preparing those who came out of prison uh, to get on a better path. And I'm, I'm proud of all of the progress that we made uh, in, in those areas. But I also became aware through a number of com many conversations in my state that so many women, and for that matter, uh, a, a significant number of men would tell me about one of the things that would often hold them back uh, from pursuing uh, their own careers and from pursuing their dreams. And that had to do when an unplanned pregnancy came about. And so when Mark Edwards, uh, who you'll be hearing from later, uh, who found co-founded Upstream USA, came to talk to me about an opportunity to uh, really empower women in Delaware so that they would be able to have their children when they really were ready for them, when they really wanted them. Uh, I was very interested. And by the way, this was for me not just an academic uh, exercise. As I said, I had hundreds and hundreds of conversations during my time in office uh, with women and, and some men who were in this position, including uh, young people that I knew very well. Uh, people that uh, my wife and I, young, young men who my young men, who my wife, my wife and I had worked with and mentored over a long period of time, told me their own stories, their own personal stories, uh, about how their own career uh, opportunities had to be delayed uh, be, because of this issue. And so I really came to realize, and Mark put it to me very well. He basically said he had come to the conclusion that one of the most important things that we could do to help all people achieve their potential was to uh, give women the power uh, to have their babies when they really were, were ready for them. And as he talked about it, and it so much resonated with my own experience and with the conversations that I had had with so many people in Delaware, uh, I, I, I agreed. So in 2011, there were 6.1 million pregnancies in, in the United States, and 45% of them were unintended. The unintended pregnancy rate in the U.S. is significantly higher than in any other uh, developed country. And as Stephanie mentioned, uh, the unintended pregnancy rate in Delaware was higher still than the national average by a, by a good margin. So I saw in Delaware, as, as Mark and I uh, started to talk about the opportunity to really move the needle in our state, I saw that we had some significant barriers to access to contraception including a lack of trained providers, health centers that required multiple appointments. This is a very big deal. If a woman said she, was, she wanted to uh, access a long-acting reversible contraceptive, she might have to come back one or two uh, or three times. There was a lot of misinformation. There was poor patient counseling. Uh, in, in, in 2015, only 30% of publicly funded community health centers nationwide provided same-day access to the full range of contraception. Now this is, I mean, this is really an extraordinary figure. It sounds like a, I'm in the weeds, but it really speaks to one of the major challenges uh, in the field. One of the largest federally qualified health centers in, in my state, in Delaware, told me that it, it had a six-month wait list for the most effective methods, the long-acting reversible contraceptives, uh, specifically the IUDs and the implant. By the way, I've become very comfortable talking about IU IUDs and implants in <laughs> settings like this. I did, in fact, in 2016, uh, in my State of the State speech, talk about this initiative, and I did it, you know, 70% because I think it's so important for my state and 30% because I just wanted in front of all these legislators to talk about IUDs and implants and watch them try to slide <laughs> under their seats. So, and I, and I was just about succeeded at that. So to address this challenge, we launched uh, an, an effort that we call Delaware Contraceptive Access Now. This is a public-private partnership uh, with Upstream USA, and Upstream USA is a, a fantastic uh, nonprofit group that provides training and advice to health centers to improve reproductive health care and access to contraception. As I mentioned, after I left uh, my time as governor, I joined the national board 
of Upstream USA, and I'm thrilled to see other states embracing uh, this opportunity as well. But I want to be clear, this is not just about LARCs. This is not just about long-acting reversible contraceptives. This is about ensuring that women have access and agency over their full rep reproductive lives, including access to the full range of contraception and preconception care. And this applies to, to all women. And essentially what we have done, and I'm sure you'll be hearing more about this from Mark, is we've really tr tried to change the way the healthcare system interacts with women of childbearing age in Delaware so that any time a woman of childbearing age interacts with the healthcare system, they're asked whether they intend to have a baby in the next year. And if the answer is yes, they're connected to the appropriate preconception and prenatal care, and if the answer is no, they're made aware of the full range of methods. By the end of 2016, the 160,000 women of reproductive age served annually uh, by Delaware CAN Health Center partners now have access to the full range of methods for free or little cost in, in a single visit. I mean, that, that is a really important sentence. And this really speaks to the progress that we have made uh, over these last few years. Colorado pioneered a similar program. In three years, it saw a savings of $5.85 and Medicaid costs for every dollar that was invested because mothers and babies ended up healthier. And while this, for me, was not about, I, di I didn't get into this because it, it represented a dollar savings. The fact is this is a win-win-win. This is better when it comes to economic opportunity for the women and maybe the, and many of the uh, fathers as well. It is about the cost savings, but it's also about the improved birth outcomes. Because when, when, when women can, are planning for their babies, the chances of having a healthy baby are much higher. So we are already seeing some very promising trends in our state. Child Trends, uh, which is a nonpartisan, nonprofit research institution that focuses on issues affecting ch children and youth, have used a simula simulation model. They call it Family Scape. And they estimate a 24% reduction in unintended pregnancy amongst a subset of Title X patients. And they do so based on the difference uptake of uh, various contraceptive methods, and you'll probably be hearing more about that today. Um, we also believe that uh, this is going to have a significant impact on abortion rates across the country, and we're already seeing it in Delaware. So in Delaware, during the first few years of our initiative, Delaware Can, uh, abortions by Delaware residents have decreased by 32% with no reduction in access to abortion. There should be some oohs and ahs at that, but I don't know if I, but that, that, is, a, that is a big deal. The teen rates of, uh, of abortion in Delaware saw an e even bigger decrease of 43%. So then, you know, the national conversation today is just so unbelievably focused on partisanship with bickering and talking heads, talking past each other. But there are so many examples of common sense, effective solutions at the state and local level across a range of issues, but certainly this one, that increase patient choice and better outcomes for everybody. So this is good for families, for society, and most importantly, this is about what women want, to be empowered to make their own decisions about their own lives. And our work in Delaware with Upstream demonstrates the success that a public-private partnership can have in a very short period of time. This only launched a few years ago, and it's replicable and it is sustainable. By empowering women to choose when and if to become pregnant, the ripple effects will benefit generations of people in our state. And I am really excited, as I mentioned, to see a number of other states embracing this, uh, pursuing uh, this themselves. And I am a huge advocate to future governors and legislators across the country that they have a responsibility to take a step back from the partisan re rhetoric and look at what really works, and this is a great example of that. So with that, I'm happy to take uh, questions. I do want to acknowledge a number of, there are a lot of Delawareans in the room, but uh, a few in particular. Dr. Carol Rattay, who you'll be uh, hearing about, is the director of the Division of Public Health uh, under Governor Carney, and she had the same position for all eight years in my administration, and this would never have happened. Uh, without Dr. Rattay's leadership, so I'm incredibly uh, grateful. Uh, Dr. Uh, Janice Tilden Burton, um, who you'll be hearing from later, 
uh, one of the leading uh, providers uh, in our state and a role model for so many. So thank you very much and uh, really grateful to you. And, and Liz O'Neill, where'd Liz go? There she is, uh, who has run Delaware Can. And, and Liz actually, uh, Liz had been in the field sort of broadly speaking for years and called me several years ago. I'll never forget the call. I was at home. And I think a report had come out about the high rate of unintended pregnancy in Delaware. And she called me. And she said, what are we going to do? And I said, you know what? I actually think we may have an idea. And uh, we were successful in recruiting her uh, to lead the effort. And uh, she continues to lead the effort. And for that, we are very grateful. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm happy to take a few, a few questions. OK, it seems like we have six or seven minutes for questions. Okay. Um, yep. Did I see? We have someone who will bring a mic around to you so everyone can hear your question. Hi. First of all, thank you so much for speaking on this, especially as governor of Delaware. That's so exciting to hear this movement. Um, so there's been a recent movement um, amongst like younger individuals in this country about recognizing that not only women can get pregnant and that also our trans folks can also get pregnant. So what does contraceptive access look like for them in Delaware? Thank you. I'm going I'm to ask Mark or Liz to, uh, I, I should have warned them, I may deflect some of the questions that, that you all may be able to an answer better than I can. I don't know if it's going to be a satisfactory answer to you, but our philosophy has always been, you know, all individuals, all methods at all of our health centers. So we use a patient-centered approach for everyone that's counseled, and I would, I would hope and assume that the care would be just optimal across the board given our philosophy and the way we've implemented our program. Right, and it's also part of, thank you, one of my quality improvement officers has let me know that um, it's, it's part of our clinical training you know, uh, curriculum that we um, deliver to all our health center partners. Only just to add that um, uh, anti-bias training is a central part of the work we do as well. And so that's just a critical issue that we have to keep in front of us. Other questions? Uh, Larry Checo. Uh, my question has to do with um, birth control, as we talked about. And it seems that, uh, you know, there's a portion of our society that doesn't want to provide birth control. And um, at the same time, many of these people are also depriving kids of child care, um, health services, child care in general, uh, school opportunities, what can we do to change this attitude? I mean, if you want kids into this world, provide them with the services that they need to succeed in it, or let women use birth control. Well, look, I mean, I think, um, you know, th th this, is an, uh, this is an and plus. And so our view is that the, um, you know, th this, is very, this is very much about empowering women to make the decisions that make sense for them. And as I mentioned at the beginning, I mean, we focused extensively, uh, you know, when I, when I was governor and the, the, the new administration continues to do so as well, on issues around uh, child care, uh, on, on programs like the Nurse Family Partnership, on programs like after school and summer school activities. I mean, this could be an entire conversation about all the supports that we need to provide in our, in our communities. Uh, so I think this is, you know, this is one piece. Uh, but I think it's an incredibly important piece. What's that? Yeah, and so, but they're not, and this is one of the great things about, you know, as, as Justice Brandeis said, states are laboratories of democracy. I believe that the states that make these kinds of investments in our children and in our families are going to do better, and over time other states are going to get that as well. Sometimes it takes a lot longer uh, than we would like, uh, but uh, I think, you know, Elected officials, public servants with foresight and vision will do the right thing, and over time, their constituents will be better served. I hope so, too. 
Can you address the politics of this program, who opposed it and who supported it? Yeah. Uh, thank you for asking that. I was nervous about the politics. I'll be honest with you. And I was wrong. I really had essentially no reason to be nervous about the politics. As I mentioned, I, I talked about this in my last State of the State speech. And I did so, uh, you know, I, 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 was, I was nervous because I thought, you know, I, I sort of, I, in fact, when Mark and I started talking about this at the beginning, I wanted to fly under the radar because I was concerned about the pushback. There's very, I mean, this is like such an unbelievable win-win-win. And if you frame it appropriately, and, I, and this is not about spin, by the way. This is, if you care about quality birth outcomes, it means you ought to do a better job of connecting prospective mothers with the appropriate preconception and prenatal care. If you care about creating better opportunities for women and men to achieve their dreams, it means that let's put them in a position where they can really have their babies when they're ready for them. And if you want to save taxpayer money, you know, the typical, the, the a healthy Medicaid labor and delivery in Delaware is $12,000. Now, a lot, of these, a lot of these deliveries are not healthy because they were unplanned. And so if you want to also do the right thing for taxpayers, this makes a whole lot of sense. And so... I advise, I, th this should work, you know, Delaware is a blue state. I will, I will grant you that. It's not, you know, it's, it's, it's red in certain places, but overall it's a blue state. But North Carolina is going to implement this program. Other, I mean, and this should work equally well in blue and red states. And my experience is that if you get out there and you explain yourself to the voters, whether they agree with you or disagree with you, they will give you the benefit of the doubt. And I think this is exactly what's going to happen on this issue. I think we have time for one last question. Hi, uh, Mara Gandel Powers from the National Women's Law Center. Um, to your last point about equally working equally in red and blue states, I'm curious how a program like this is implemented in a state like North Carolina where there's a not-so-distant history of reproductive coercion yeah. and where certain folks and providers may be particularly interested in preventing certain unintended pregnancies or pregnancies right. generally. This is an incredibly important question, and it's one of the reasons that I'm so proud uh, of the work that Upstream has done in terms of reaching out uh, to advocates uh, across the country and particularly groups who are especially uh, concerned about exactly that. And so I think we really have to focus on this being something that is available to all women. And we have, and there's no question with the, uh, with the history that we have uh, in this country around that issue, we've got to be incredibly concerned. We, and we have to raise it from the beginning. And I think it's true uh, in our training. And we need to be, we all of us need to be held accountable accountable for that because I think it's uh, we have a really sad history uh, uh, you know for in, in many ways uh, around the, around this issue and um, you know it's something that has come up with some of the uh, activists not so much in Delaware but so, some elsewhere and I know that upstream is working really really hard to try to make sure that we address those issues appropriately but th thanks for raising the question Okay, I'm afraid that's all the questions we have time for. Please join me in thanking Governor Markell. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.